Thank you all for your interest in our work. I'm Apoorv, and this is Aditya. We work in the compute platform team at Uber. And today, we are going to talk about our ongoing migration to Kubernetes. Here is a brief summary of what we are going to talk about. First, we will introduce the compute platform team at Uber and what we work on. Then, we will briefly capture the current status of our migration. Then we want to take this opportunity to give credit where it's due to the community and talk about the unique features which we heavily use and have found to work really well without requiring any changes. Next, we talk about a few features and customizations we implement on top of Kubernetes, um, why we implement them so as to make it better suited for Uber's needs. And finally, we talk about some of the interesting uh, learnings we had during the course of the migration. First, let me introduce the compute platform team at Uber. Today, Uber manages its own on-prem data center, as well as leverages capacity from Oracle and Google Cloud. These providers are abstracted away from the platforms via layer we call Crane, which essentially implements host as a service. It ingests capacity from these providers, provisions the host and the VMs with the right OS, the right image, installs the right set of packages, and essentially makes the node ready for use by platforms. Above Crane, we have the container orchestration layer, which essentially provides container as a service to the rest of the company. Today, this layer is built on top of Mesos and Peloton, where Peloton is a custom framework on Mesos and we are in the process of migrating this layer to Kubernetes. This layer is, or this platform, is used to run all the stateless microservices at Uber, including the ones which run on shared infrastructure, the ones which require its own dedicated infrastructure to run, as well as low-level infrastructure services which are required to boot up the rest of the infrastructure. A number of batch workloads are also run on this platform, including all machine learning workloads, all Jupyter notebook sessions, and a subset of Spark workloads. The Spark workloads which run on this platform are the ones which don't run on Yarn very well due to numerous reasons like requiring large containers or requiring customized features like uh, gang scheduling or uh, custom Docker images, et cetera. This talk is primarily going to focus on the stateless side of things. We have another talk at 325 by Amit and Kevin, uh, which will talk about the bad side of things at Uber. Before moving forward, let me uh, briefly capture the scale at which we operate and how we think about scale. Today, our stateless fleet runs more than uh, actually thousands of services across millions of cores. However, the one big factor which has a significant impact on how we think about scale is the number of deploys which run every day in our fleet. We have fairly sophisticated CI-CD platforms, and nearly all our services are onboarded onto it. And every service gets deployed multiple times in a single day in our fleet. So averaged over 30 days, we see more than a million and a half containers launched every day in our fleet. And this is averaged over 30 days. Um, there are times during uh, the heavy deploy times where we see new pod launches at the rate of 120 to 130 new pod launches every second. And note that this is just the new pod launch rate. The actual pod churn rate is actually much higher. So whenever we design our system or we think about migrating to a new platform like Kubernetes, this is the one factor. The high pot generated is something which we explicitly account for and design for. Next, for context, let me also capture where we are in terms of our migration to Kubernetes. We started at the start of this year, and as of today, more than 70% of our stateless fleet is running on Kubernetes. And we expect to be done by sometime uh, next half. We have multiple 5,000 node clusters. And our largest cluster is between 5,000 and 6,000 nodes today. And we expect it to grow to around 7,500 nodes. We 
when we started this migration, based on our previous experiences with using open source technologies at Uber, including Mesos and others, and also having done similar migrations like this in the past, we laid out a number of principles for us. I'm going to capture the three most important ones here. The first one is seamless upgrades. We would like to run Kubernetes version in our fleet at the same version as what the cloud providers are running at that point in time. In the past, with Mesos and other open source code, we had really struggled to upgrade our fleet to the new open source version. And based on those learnings, we decided that when we move to Kubernetes, we are going to use the upstream code as is with no to minimal changes to the upstream code. And we are going to rely on Kubernetes native extensibility like plugins and CRDs to inject any customization. The second principle is reliable upgrades. In the past, whenever we tried to upgrade open source to a new version, invariably we always had incidents and issues in production. To mitigate against that, for Kubernetes, we have built extensive release validation with numerous integration end-to-end, -end, and most importantly, performance tests, so as to capture any regression before we roll out into release. And another thing which we did, which has really helped us, is that we have continuous probes running in our clusters, which keep testing our cluster control planes, so as to ensure no regression. And if any, uh, any issue is detected, we immediately roll back the new release. The final principle is around transparent and automated migrations. During previous migrations, we found that any time we require any developer to do any effort or we change the developer experience in, in, in an unexpected way, that migration invariably failed. So as a principle, we said that we, don't, we want to do this migration, which is fully automated and completely transparent from all developers. That is, the developers just keep running their service as is, um, like any normal day. Underneath, we change the platform from Mesos to Kubernetes without anyone doing anything or even noticing that something has changed. We want to keep this incident free with no business impact to Uber. So let me talk about how we accomplish the transparent and automated migration. And for that, let me introduce UP. UP um, is a platform owned by our sister team. And it implements Uber's global stateless federation layer. It is the primary service owner interface and provides a number of, uh, fed of federation features, including safe rollouts, continuous deployments, and distributing service capacity across multiple availability zones for service high availability. Importantly, it abstracts away the cluster technology of Mesos or Kubernetes away from developers. One interesting feature it has is what we call cluster selection, where within one availability zone, if we have multiple clusters, then it rebalances services away from clusters with high allocation to clusters with low allocation. So this allows us to do automated migration, because what we do is that we just move the physical capacity from Mesos to Kubernetes. Thus, the allocation in Mesos becomes higher, the allocation percentage in Kubernetes becomes lower, and up automatically rebalances. So this allows us to just run an automated migration. Um, so how do we do a transparent migration? The fact that we have up, which is abstracting away, the underlying cluster technology obviously is a very important step in achieving transparent migration. And that's what allows us to even think about doing a transparent migration. However, as you may guess, compute is a central infrastructure piece which integrates with numerous other infrastructure platforms which all developers use. So when migrating to Kubernetes, we have to rebuild all these existing integrations. And given Kubernetes and Mesos have numerous subtle differences, each of these integrations require um, a, a, very, a very thoughtful design so as to ensure that the developer re experience remains exactly the same. In the subsequent slides, you will see a few examples of the customizations we had to build on top of Kubernetes to ensure this. Next, we want to take this opportunity to thank the community for providing numerous well-built features, which we directly use without making any changes to it. 
Note that this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a subset of some things we thought are fairly unique to Kubernetes. And uh, pretty much anyone who is running Kubernetes should be using these. The first is the default kube scheduler. It's awesome. It's super stable, super scalable. Six scheduling and six scalability in the past few releases have done an amazing job in just scaling it up. Um, another thing which you want to call out is the plugin architecture which kube scheduler has. We heavily leverage it, not only to use the numerous plugins which other companies have built and open source, but also to inject a couple of our own specific customizations. The next is security. The security first nature of Kubernetes that stands out. I think like one of the teams who is the most happiest with our migration to Kubernetes is the engineering security team because they are able to reuse most of the features directly from Kubernetes and significantly upgrade our security posture. An example is how do we secure our own cluster control plane? We use search for Authn and RBAC for Auth Z. Both are super intuitive and provide enough granularity for us to be able to really secure it. We are now actually exploring an authentication proxy to, as a validating admission controller to potentially set up personal access control. The next feature is API priority and fairness, which we heavily use to protect API server and etcd. We have set up limits not only for every controller, every operator, every service which integrates with our control plane, but also we limit what operations can they perform on the cluster. For example, we have pretty much disabled the use of direct get and direct list except during an informal startup on to API server directly. This particular feature has protected our clusters from going hard down at least once, actually more than once during the migration is, and is one of the primary reasons we have had an incident-free migration up till now. The next is controller runtime ecosystem. We, all our controllers and operators are built on top of it. It's great, it's intuitive to use, great telemetry, no performance hit in using it. Finally, and uh, something which is not that well known is support for separate events database, which is super helpful to us because it allows us to scale our clusters pretty well without losing the auditability and debuggability provided by events. I'm now going to hand it over to Aditya, who will talk about the customizations we have added for Uber developers and also discuss why we added them, and also talk about some interesting learnings we have had during the course of this migration. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aditya. I work with Apoor on the container platform team at Uber. Uh, as Apoor mentioned a few slides earlier, Transparent migration is one of our key migration guiding principles as part of this project. What that means is as we move from Mesos to Kubernetes, uh, our developers should continue to have the same developer experience, uh, the same levels of deployment safety, as well as developer velocity. Uh, to that end, we have built numerous features uh, to achieve this on top of uh, native gates. Uh, for example, we have abstracted away service intent uh, into a CRD. Uh, we allow for retrieving container artifacts after a pod has exited. Uh, we allow setting U limits on your container, uh, which then uh, let service owners set things like FT limits, for example. Uh, we have improved the scale of uh, Kubernetes UI. Uh, for example, if you take the Kates UI natively and point it to a 7500 node cluster, with say 200k pods, uh, it is going to take about over seven, eight minutes to load. With our optimizations, this happens under 10 seconds. Uh, I'm going to pause here, and uh, the features that are highlighted, we are going to talk in detail uh, in the subsequent slides. But if you think there is anything here that is applicable outside of Uber as well, we are all ears. We want to talk about it. We want to find ways in which we can give back to the community. So to take, apps, uh, to take transparent migrations further, what that really means is that we do not want uh, our service owners to care about any of the Kubernetes internals, nor do we want to expose them uh, in, in a lot of uh, depth to our federation platform, which is up. 
for example, if a service uh, wants to run on custom SKUs, like some NVIDIA specific GPU, uh, service owners should just tell us that and not tell us to use a specific node selector feature to, so that their service runs there. Uh, so what we have done is abstracted away service intent as part of a Uber deployment CRD. So the intent can be uh, the service needs image prefetching or in-place updates or dedicated hardware, for example. Uh, and the CRD controller's job is to then translate this intent into a meaningful one or more Kubernetes-specific expressions and actually make it happen. So to keep developer experience uh, seamless, we support a widely used feature at Uber called Container Artifacts Retrieval. Uh, today, our developers are able to access their artifacts like uh, core dumps or heap profiles even after their container exits. These artifacts are written to local disk and exposed to the users via a Mesos endpoint. Uh, for example, Java services are configured to write their pprof and core dumps locally, and these are very useful for debugging, uh, for developers to debug their crashed or whom killed containers uh, for some time after the container has already crashed. We lose this functionality when we move to Kates because uh, all the local volumes and this local data on the host gets cleaned up after, a, uh, like during pod deletion. To support this in Kates, we introduced a artifact uploader daemon that uploads these artifacts to a blob store on container exit. So how does this work? Uh, we have introduced a sidecar container as part of all of our stateless pods. Uh, the main objective of this sidecar container is to buy us time after a primary container exits until a pod is deleted. So once a primary container exits, be it for normal uh, updates or abnormal exits like um kills or sec faults, uh, the artifact uploader daemon on the host gets a signal, it execs into the sidecar, it uh, tars up all of these artifacts that the developers care about, and then it uploads them to Blob Store. Uh, and then it asks the sidecar container to kill itself. Uh, upon that delete, uh, the pod gets deleted and all the local artifacts get cleaned up. In terms of uh, deployment safety, a widely used feature at Uber is controlled or gradual scaling. We have multiple services which uh, which use membership-based protocols, like Apache Helix, we have Celery Workers, we have Sharded Services, and all of them are very sensitive to rapid scale-ups or rapid scale-downs. Uh, so to support this, we looked at what comes closest in the native ecosystem, and the thing that comes closest is a rolling update spec. Uh, but this is applicable only during actual updates. Uh, on the contrary, Kubernetes is actually optimized to make scales go as fast as possible. Uh, so to support this, we introduced a batch sizing concept uh, in Uber deployment CRD. So our federation layer can uh, specify a batch size during scale operations. So if you specify a batch size of three and you want to go from 10 to 20 instances, you go in steps of 10, 13, 16, 19, and then 20. So we talked about slowing down your scale operations, but a majority of service owners, they actually want to deploy their code to production as fast as possible. We heavily use CI-CD, service owners deploy multiple times based uh, using CI-CD, uh, and therefore the desire is to do this as quickly as possible. Also, with, with these rapid rollouts, we also want to make sure that incident mitigation is uh, super quick. So we can deploy like hot fixes very quickly. Some services at Uber, uh, it's very hard to do this for those services because uh, one reason is that their containers are super large. Uh, for example, a container of a service can take up to like more than 25% of a host resource. Uh, our clusters run fairly hot at 85 to 90% allocation which means that uh, plus, plus there is a lot of churn like we talked about earlier, so a lot of pods are restarting, being moved around, which means that our clusters are inherently fragmented. And that means that there is not enough hosts, typically, that have that much free capacity to house these pods. So it takes a long time to place them. Once we actually place them, it, 
it is it is highly desirable that they do not lose this placement across updates uh, now when the pod actually gets placed it is also running into issues like cold start because these pods will have image sizes close to 5 gigs sometimes and it takes a long time to download these images and then start the pod so all of these things uh, uh, they combine towards like a, a slower rollout so to 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 sort of uh, solve this problem we introduced uh, we started using clone sets which are uh, uh, which are developed by alibaba uh, they are a kids resource that provide us in place updates uh, using pod patching so now that we have solved the in place updating problem we we introduced a image prefetch daemon uh, which uh, allows for uh, prefetching all these uh, images that are being downloaded so when an update is taking place we go zone by zone so if if we are updating zone a we will notify the image prefetch daemon in zones b and c to pre download the image that is being updated so that when the update hits zone b the image is already present on those hosts another interesting feature uh, we provide is a unique 32 bit instance id for per pod they are unique within a service and an environment developers want to identify issues with uh, single instance failures uh, they do so by tagging their metrics and logs with uh, instance ids to improve their debuggability uh, if they are not assigned unique ids their metrics can get jumbled so uniqueness is very important uh, to developers we support this by using the last five characters of a pod id uh, and we add service name and environment name with some padding to the first 58 characters so the last five characters are random but they are still unique to that scope of a service and environment so an ask from the community is to provide hopefully ways of making this uh, slightly better so even before we started uh, with this migration we talked to a lot of uh, community members we read a, did a lot of research and the general uh, general consensus within the community was that we should set up large number of small clusters uh, the cluster sizes were like 1000 to 1500 nodes at uber we were doing the exact opposite of this our cluster sizes were uh, for mesos were between 5000 to 7500 nodes why did we do this we did this so that uh, we reduce fragmentation issues we reduce the amount of stranded capacity that we can no longer use if there are like smaller clusters and we reduced uh, operational toil so with kubernetes we wanted to see for ourselves uh, we wanted to get a reproducible setup where we can scale kubernetes uh, to our uh, requirements uh, we we set up a state of the art benchmarking cluster using kubemark and uh, cluster loader and i'm happy to note uh, that we were able to get 7500 nodes 200k pods and 150 pod launches per second reliably using this cluster with no on like minimal changes to the core uh, kubernetes uh, control plane so kudos to the community for that there were some minor config and software changes that we had to do for example we had to carefully tune qps settings parallelism for controller manager and scheduler uh, we restrict the api calls like list and get uh, using api priority and fairness we use proto encoding instead of json so we heard in the talk that crd is now support proto instead of json which is awesome uh, we we made some software changes to speed up uh, things like the pod topology spread scheduler plugin with all of these changes we could actually get to the desired scale that we wanted so far we talked about what we proactively did to make sure this migration was seamless but as we went ahead uh, with the migration we saw some unexpected issues uh, some unexpected behaviors some quirks and some lack of tooling uh, which i will get into with this uh, slide so generally we did not see a holistic monitoring solution out of the box to help us reason about the state of the cluster for, for for example uh, we wanted to we we started seeing a lot more fragmentation issues on kubernetes uh, versus mesos and one of the reasons was we did not have in place updates uh, there were pod, higher pod churns we used make before break and so on 
uh, we could not we could not find a tool to uh, to really investigate where this fragmentation is and answer questions like why is my pod not being placed uh, there are some ways with, with which you can use kubectl and like script around it but uh, they all use some variant of like aggressive listing which we wanted to avoid uh, we saw issues where uh, pods kept getting rescheduled on same degraded hosts and get uh, get crash loop all the time uh, we saw issues with noisy neighbors, but we could not figure out why a set of hosts were seeing degraded performance. We wanted something to tell us uh, if there are common set of services running across this uh, uh, these many uh, these many nodes. Uh, we could we don't we didn't have enough uh, visibility into that. Uh, we 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 wanted more visibility into the kind of churn this cluster is seeing in terms of how many parallel updates are there straggling updates are there struck updates. So to fix all of that, we, we built a, a, a deployment, uh, an observability tool uh, ourselves. Another quirk was that we saw was with uh, native informers and the way they reconcile uh, their, their events. So the way native Kubernetes informers reconcile is uh, every eight to 10 hours, they will replay all the events in their cache to their controller uh, so that they make sure that none of the events is missed. This works fairly okay for a smallish cluster with no churn, but we have seen issues where sometimes a deployment gets created and the deployment create event is not acted upon because at the same time, the controller is having a leadership change. So that deployment create event uh, gets lost and then the next time it is actually acted upon is after eight to 10 hours which is not desirable. So we created a custom reconciliation mechanism for high-level objects like Uber deployments. Similar to faster rollouts, we also want to ensure that our rollbacks are pretty quick uh, and deterministic. So to do that, we started using progress deadline seconds and uh, we treated PDS as a wall clock timer. Uh, that didn't work out quite as expected because we had some services which had uh, disabled their health checks, but they still had crash looping pods. We had services that had health checks enabled, but they had like a long initial delay for those health checks. For both these cases, the deployment kept making some sort of progress uh, because the pods crash looped, but before that they were marked ready immediately. So whenever it appears to make progress, the PDS timer gets reset. So we couldn't use it. So we decided to use a heuristic like uh, number of container restarts during a rollout. For example, if we see more than 10% of pods getting restarted five or more times during a rollout, we consider that as a bad rollout and we roll back. Lastly, I want to note that we couldn't have made this rapid progress uh, without a global federation layer of up as well as investing in portability of services. Uh, so because of these two things, plus our extensive efforts in making sure things are reliable, uh, at, at our peak, we were moving about 250K to 300K cores per week, which is a pretty high num number in my opinion. So, so far we have talked about our stateless side of uh, story. Where we are going with this is uh, we have uh, multiple cluster management technologies at Uber. We have Yarn to schedule batch workloads like Spark jobs, Flink, Presto jobs. And we have Odin to manage stateful workloads like Cassandra, Redis, and so on. As a company, we have decided to converge on Kubernetes as a unified platform for all of these workloads. So yeah, watch this space for the next year or two. Uh, we'll have more updates on that. Lastly, I want to thank uh, all the teams mentioned here for their support and work during this uh, migration, as well as the Kates community. You guys are awesome. Apoor and I are merely representing your hard work. So thank you very much for your efforts. And with that, we can go to Q&A. Uh, if I understand correctly, during your message to Kubernetes migration, you spread the workloads per instance across 
Mesos and Kubernetes, is that correct? If that's so, uh, how, how does uh, uh, an instance in Mesos discover the pods in, in Kubernetes and, and vice versa? So was how, how does your service discovery looks like between Mesos and, and Kubernetes during the migration process? So we have a service mesh. I mean, so basically we have a service mesh and we integrate the service, same service mesh with both Mesos and Kubernetes. Um, and the integration looks exactly the same. So the pods in Kubernetes as well as containers and Mesos are visible to each other through the service mesh. All right, thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. So my question, I have one question and then a follow up based on the same question. So. Um, I remember, I think I remember you said you were using 48 core hosts. Um, so, and then you also made some other optimizations with uh, the API limits, et cetera, bursts, et cetera. So how do you define the trade-off between throwing more resources and actually optimizing for the various parameters within the uh, objects? And the follow-up based on that is, um, since you said it's a 48 core host, how do you again define the trade off between having, let's say, 12 eight core, ho uh, eight core hosts, um, which give, might give you more resiliency, probably, versus single large hosts run a big cluster like that? Um, so, those are two of my That's questions. That's an excellent question. So, um, so the way so the, way, so the way we think about it is that we want as large hosts as possible because larger the hosts, uh, the less fragmentation we see. Uh, I mean, it's the same thing. Like we have large clusters as well as large hosts within the cluster, so as to reduce fragmentation, right? Now, why we can't go just to like, let's say, like a thousand core machine or you know, like something like that? I mean, uh, the reason is that uh, we have host agents which run, including a service mesh, the metrics, logging, and so on. And as we keep scaling the host up, uh, the daemons and the kernel itself needs to keep scaling up. Uh, we found some issues as we move forward, and we are fixing them. So yes, we use 48 core machines right now. We are already moving to 96. We hope to move to 120 and 256 um, over time. Uh, but it requires like a careful scaling of the demons on the host. For example, Docker didn't scale. So when we moved to Kubernetes, we got container D, and that scales pretty well. Uh, so moving to Kubernetes allowed us to also be able to move to a larger machine. OK, and do you also orchestrate your control plane um, at, on larger machines as well? Uh, the control plane, um, so the control plane is, so basically what we did is as part of our benchmarking, we figured out what is the minimum size of the machine and what is the disk IOPS and what's the memory and so on, like what is the best instance size, instance type which fits that control plane and that's what we have chosen, right? So we want to keep the cost low, uh, so we chose the cheapest possible machine which gives us the maximum um, of which allows us to reach the scale we want to reach. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm curious to hear about uh, the optimization that you did on the reconciliation. You were saying that you have the recent period every eight hours, and then you did some optimization on it. Yeah. So you're talking about the reconciliation, uh, like how we did it. Yeah, the recent okay. period to not have to wait like eight hours. Uh, right, right. So by default, informers have a setting uh, which says, which, which is kind of a little misleading. It says reconcile, which I thought would like relist, but it doesn't relist. Uh, it actually just replays its cache every, there's like a randomized timer between eight or 12 hours. Anytime this happens between eight to 12 hours, it, uh, all events are replayed. Uh, so for example, if a deployment creation event is part of that uh, new events list and it is not acted upon by a controller at that same time because, for example, we had a leadership failover, right? That's when this becomes a problem because then you have to wait for the whole resync to happen every 12 hours. So your deployment got created, so the developer is like, hey, I created my deployment, why, is, why are you not doing anything with it? So that's why we want to reconcile high-level objects, uh, force reconcile them every 15 minutes. Okay, thanks. Hello, thank you for the talk. I was just curious, like, if you can share more about your experience moving from Mesos to Kubernetes about resource uh, enforcement, resource limit enforcement, so request and limits. Uh, in the Mesos platform versus on Kubernetes. 
Uh, so, can you repeat? So, you talked about uh, the request yeah, and limits. Yeah, I mean, in, in Kubernetes, there is like request and limits, like so that are enforced essentially at the Kubernetes level using CFS. I'm just curious, like, what was your experience like moving from Mesos to I Kubernetes? See. So, um, so in Mesos, we didn't use revocable, if if you know what that means, right? So, uh, so we didn't use CPU over commitment as much. So we used to use CPU over, over commitment before, but we disabled it long uh, some time back. So when we move to Kubernetes, essentially it is equal, request equals to limit is what we use because we don't have overcommitment of CPU. Uh, moving forward, if you have to enable overcommitment, we will do it on a case by case basis. Um, uh, what else about? Yeah, no, that, that's fine. Yeah, okay. That's cool. Awesome. Yeah, overall, I think like, uh, like Kubernetes is a more, uh, I, I mean, like the just the amount of features available in Kubernetes as compared to Mesos are huge. And overall, the migration has been like pretty good. For, our, for security as well as uh, numerous other reasons. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, thank okay. you for your- Thank you so much. <laughs>